The most important marking on all of your gear is actually the sticker on the back of your helmet. This tells you how it was tested and how safe it really is. There are a few ways that helmets are typically tested. The most common is either a flat or angled anvil, a penetration test where it's basically a spike hitting the top of the helmet, and they also test the retention of the strap to make sure that in an impact your helmet won't go flying off. All helmets sold in the United States are required to have this little sticker on the back that says FMVSS218 certified. This stands for Department of Transportation Federal Vehicle Motor Safety Standard Number 218. With FMVSS 218 or DOT, there's actually no requirement for governmental testing. I can manufacture a helmet today made out of paper mache and sell it to you, and I would be subject to a fine if I got caught. DOT does go out and they do purchase helmets off the shelf. They purchase about 40 helmets a year, and if those helmets don't meet their standards, then the helmet manufacturer is subject to a $5,000 fine, for instance. This is actually one of the reasons why I'll never buy a built helmet. I don't trust them, and if you actually look at them, they currently have a bunch of open recalls because the helmets were not FMVSS 2 and 8 certified, which is literally the bare minimum standard. The bar is on the floor. FMVSS 218 was created in 1974 and has gone largely unchanged since then. The biggest update was in 2013, and the bulk of it was about this sticker on the back. They required it to now say FMVSS 218 certified. This was to make it easier for law enforcement to see if you were using a novelty helmet. So they didn't really care about your safety, they just want to make sure that they can get your revenue out of you if you're using a fake helmet. There were also some changes regarding the safety strap on the helmet, so it wasn't completely unchanged, but it, for the most part it was unchanged. The impact thresholds for DOT are 400 G. Now that is a lot of impact force, and for reference, concussions typically happen between 90 and 100 Gs of impact. When DOT does helmet testing, they do a flat and angled impact test. They also test the chin strap and they do a penetration test. Their penetration test is a six pound weight dropped from 10 foot, 10 inches onto the helmet. Thankfully here in the United States, we can get additional testing. This helmet's actually Snell certified. So what's Snell? Snell was created in 1957. It's a memorial foundation set up in the name of Pete William Snell, who passed away in 1957 after a crash in automotive racing. During this wreck, his helmet actually failed to protect him. He thought he was being protected, and obviously he wasn't. With Snell, helmet manufacturers actually have to pay to send their helmets into Snell and see if they can pass. So if a helmet fails, it's quite expensive for the manufacturers to come back, revise that helmet, and then pay to send it off again. Because of this, there are some helmet manufacturers that choose not to pay these additional costs just for the right to put a sticker in their helmet. Snell has a significantly lower impact threshold at 285 Gs. So that's a full 115 G lower than DOT. They also do a double impact test. So they'll take and hit the helmet in the exact same spot twice to see how it performs. This is a little bit controversial because Snell has a very firm shell and ECE and FIM actually have a softer shell. Their theory is that the energy should be absorbed by the helmet, not transmitted through the helmet into the rider's head. The other side of that is with the dual impact. What are the odds that during a wreck, you're gonna hit your head in the exact same spot? So. There's some argument that it's kind of not useful for motorcycle testing, though it is possible, and I've seen it happen, where people do hit their head in the same exact spot twice. Because of the way that Snell helmets are tested, this also means that the helmets are typically heavier. This means more weight on your head and more rotational mass if you do get into a wreck, therefore increasing your likelihood of a neck injury. Snell helmets were originally designed for automotive racing, where the weight of the helmet isn't as much of an issue, especially if you have like a Hans device as opposed to a motorcycle wreck where obviously we want our stuff to be as light as possible because our head's getting jostled all around in the event of a wreck. So for the actual testing, Snell does do a test for potential brain acceleration, and if the brain could accelerate too quickly in an impact, the helmet does not pass. They also do a roll-off test to make sure that the helmet can't pull off your head in the event of a wreck, and they also test the chin strap to make sure that it's not going to fail in a wreck. There's also a chin bar test where they basically slam a weight into the chin bar of the helmet to make sure that it's safe enough to absorb an impact. Snell does do a penetration test where they drop a 3.3 kilogram or roughly 6.6 .6 pound weight onto the helmet from heights to make sure that nothing can penetrate the shell. Now in 2020, Snell did find themselves the center of a controversy. They continued to do the typical double impact test as well as some testing was requiring a softer, lighter shell and they test more in line with ECE and FIM. Because of the way these helmets are tested, you can't be both simultaneously. So what's the point of the standard if they're going to contradict themselves? And the only way to really tell it apart is on the inside of the helmet on the Snell sticker, you'll have M2020D or M2020R. The next standard we have is the ECE 2205. ECE stands for the Economic Commission of Europe. And it was created in the year 2000. This is the most common standard worldwide and it's used in over 50 countries. The impact threshold for ECE 2205 is 275 G. They are typically lighter and they do have that softer shell and EPS layer combo. This helps to absorb the impact within the helmet rather than have energy transferred directly through to your head. The impact testing is considered to be more realistic than DOT 
as well as the requirement for governmental oversight in the testing, and they actually do test more than just one helmet. They do test helmets out of the production batch. There is some concern that the way ECE helmets are tested, that manufacturers are just reinforcing the specific sites where they know their helmets are going to be tested. And that's the reason why we're seeing lighter and lighter helmets, is because these helmets are only safe in certain spots where they're actually going to be tested. With ECE 2205, there's also not as many tests done on the helmets as there are with Snell, and there's no penetration test. In 2020, we saw the release of ECE 2206. This is a very good standard, and we saw the increase of six test sites on ECE 2205, up to 18 individual test sites for impacts on ECE 2206. They added an oblique impact test. The flat anvil test is now subject to more heights and more speeds, and there's also additional testing on the chin strap. In addition to all of that, we now have a visor test. They basically take a six millimeter sphere, think like a BB, and shoot it at 60 meters per second at the visor to make sure that the visor doesn't break. This is so that you can test anything like a rock hitting your visor and making sure that it doesn't penetrate the visor and hit the rider. On top of that, now all helmets that have like built-in speakers, built-in cameras, all of that has to be in the helmet when they test it. No more of this pulling those out, testing the helmet, and then putting anything in that can compromise the safety of the helmet. We have a rear to front roll off to make sure that the helmet just can't be ripped off of your head and they also do a front to rear for modular helmets. The impact threshold remains the same at 275 Gs, but now we also have a neck rotation impact test to help minimize neck injuries in the event of an accident. I've done a lot of research on this standard, and it's actually extremely close to the FIM standard up until the 2022 FIM update. And now we get into the top standard. This is FIM. This is the standard that's required for pretty much all forms of motorsports outside of the U.S. In the U.S., I'm not sure if they require it for all forms of motorsports, but I know Snell takes the standard for a lot of them like NASCAR. This is an extremely good standard, and I wouldn't have an issue recommending an FIM-rated helmet to anybody. The impact thresholds for FIM are a little bit confusing. Basically, they do three tests. Test number one and number two must be at or below 275 G, and test number three must be at or below 208 Gs. One of the concerns with FIM is they don't actually test every single helmet size. So for example, this helmet is the Shoei X14. Worldwide, this is FIM certified. In the United States, they don't have it. They opted for the Snell certification. I don't know why, but it's what they did. Now with this helmet, if I were to buy the XL, it's not actually Snell certified. The small, medium, and large are. So if you're getting an FIM certified helmet, you have to make sure that the specific size that you wear also carries that certification. I'll put a link down below to the FIM's website, which shows every single helmet they've tested, how they test them, and you can make sure that whatever helmet you're looking for is certified in the size that you're going to buy it. Now beyond ECE, DOT, Snell, and FIM, we get into additional safety features such as MIPS. MIPS stands for Multi-Directional Impact System. This MIPS was created by Peter Halladin and Hans von Holst with the goal of creating a way to offer more protection against rotation in the event of a wreck. So how does MIPS work? MIPS is basically a low friction liner that sits on the inside of the helmet, and this allows the helmet to move 10 to 15 millimeters in the event of an impact. So that 10 to 15 millimeters is impact that your head doesn't have to move, but the helmet does. Another thing I see all the time is people saying that you need to get a race helmet instead of a street helmet, that way it's safer, and it's not always true. While yes, some race helmets do have a higher safety standard, other helmets that are just street oriented can also be like FIM certified. So why would we get a race helmet then? Race helmets have better airflow and better aerodynamics, but they're not necessarily safer because of this. They're designed to be worn in more of a tuck position, allowing you to see higher and wider, so that when you're hanging off the bike or in a tuck, you can still see where you're going. The downside of this is they're a lot louder. If you're gonna be wearing a race fit helmet, you also need to be wearing earplugs. I have what's called tinnitus from not wearing earplugs. This is a constant ringing in my ears. If I could go back 10 years and be wearing earplugs sooner, I would. For you guys' convenience, I'll have a link to these exact earplugs. These are what I wear. I've been wearing them for years, and they're by far the best and most comfortable ones that I've found. I'll put a link to them down below. Full disclosure, this is going to be an affiliate link. I will earn a slight commission, but it doesn't cost anything extra for you guys. It just really helps support the channel. Another thing you need to consider is the price point of your helmet. Just because a helmet is more expensive doesn't necessarily mean that it's safer. So my Shoei X14 here is just as safe as an AVG Pista, but it's half the price. As I mentioned in my last video, more premium helmets don't necessarily offer more protection, but they do typically have more features. There's no reason why you need to feel obligated to go out and spend $1,500 on a helmet when a five or $600 helmet meets the same exact safety certifications. Now, oftentimes the more expensive helmet will have more features, maybe better airflow, better visibility potentially, Usually the liners of them are, more, are nicer, but I've seen some helmets where that's not the case and it's just marketing. So be aware and don't feel obligated to go out and spend more than your budget for a helmet. So which helmet would I go with then? 
I personally think DOT is the absolute worst standard and I would not buy a helmet that is just DOT rated. From there, I'd go ECE 2205, Snell M2020, which is just, again, the current standard, followed by ECE 2206, and the one that I would prefer to buy the most is FIM. And just a reminder to you guys, you can have the most expensive, highest rated helmet on the market, and if it doesn't fit you properly, it's not gonna offer you much more protection than a five gallon bucket would. So leave me a comment below and let me know, did you guys know about the helmet ratings? And if you did, what rating did you go with? Stay tuned for my next video where I'll teach you guys how to properly size and fit a helmet.